and do it in a way that doesn't kill all of us to try to carry that burden. Um, and we can ultimately spread that love to other sets of people, and they can pick it up. And there is, there are methodologies to it because I'm, I'm very much interested in how do we learn and understand um, these sets of crises that are around us, and breaking those down into sets of tools and approaches, um, and pushing at the boundaries of what of how we learn and how we know. Um, so there is a methodolog a methodological urgency, but for me, there's a practice urgency. Um, and that is one thing that I know links a lot of the way that I imagine my research work with, I think, both curators and artists and other creatives is to think about all of this as practice. Um, so that is how you have this title, Praxis Interruptus. Um, and I really wanted to see how do we use this network in this moment to sort of interrupt. Um, that might be interrupting our own thought processes, interrupting our own ways of working, interrupting our comfort zones, interrupting our assumptions that we have the answers to problems that we don't actually even know exist yet, um, and ultimately trying to figure out ways of working. Um, and that's one of the things that I want to try to hope to get us to by the time that we get um, to the end. Now, before I start, I, I, I'm going to acknowledge a couple of people who are in the room. Um, probably, and they probably don't know that they're probably going to get acknowledged. Um, one is Barbara Asante and the other is Teresa Cisneros. And there's a reason for this acknowledgement. One is the fact that um, a lot of my interactions that I've had in London with different sets of people uh, were set up initially through relationships with Teresa. Um, and it was uh, essentially another friend of ours who, not unlike with Roshini, was thinking, why don't the two of you know each other? you should talk. Um, I reached out and, and essentially uh, met her, brought my daughter along to that, that conversation, um, but uh, essentially met her and through the exchanges and conversations eventually met Barbie and various other sets of folks. And one of the things that I've realized, um, because I'm not necessarily part of the cultural sector in a sense, I don't, I don't um, present myself as that, um, but there is an incredible amount of urgency and work that's happening that many of you are probably involved in. Um, you may not be involved in other sets of work that's happening in other research spaces or that might be happening in universities if you're not related to any of them um, or connected to them. And it became really quite clear to me through these interactions how much we don't talk to each other. We don't talk to each other about strategies. Um, we, we might talk to each other about work and outputs and materials and shows and things, not about strategies, the actual strategic work of trying to do this, um, the building blocks. Um, what does it feel like to go into the archives and to viscerally live that experience and to try to shake it off to try to continue to do your work? We don't talk about those things. And I hope we can do um, that as well as, as talking about um, the strategic aspects uh, uh, of, of, of building the work, but also the strategic aspects of doing the work. Um, and I'm going to preface again to Teresa, because this little bit comes from a talk that we uh, co-jointly gave at Parks last year. Um, and this is in relationship to a project that, uh, that Teresa was initially leading called Holding Space. But one of the things that we noted as we kept talking to each other over time was what does it mean to essentially hold any kind of space, um, especially spaces where there is injustice uh, among sets of people. And reflecting on this, is something that I think about within my own work, um, you know, working with various different institutions, working with huge systems of colonial uh, destabilization, dispossession. As I start working with various uh, activists or community people, or who doesn't matter what they might be, and I can't make assumptions that everybody is coming into a table, all equal, and are actually able to exchange any sets of terms that are equal and that actually are able to move forward with any set of justice that's going to be equal, right? Um, and that means that if I'm going to bring all of those folks together, I have an incredible amount of responsibility, essentially, to hold that space. If I'm, if I'm really working toward <coughs> an equitable kind of future. <coughs> yes, I do need one of you, there's some <coughs> Now, I'm starting here because I want you to think about this, about this forum, and about this space itself as a holding space. And 
I'm going to draw your attention to a number of these terms that are here. Means to be with, work with, work through and alongside. Um, the land could be they can practice relations, the expectations of, of, of others, a space to be honest, a space to think and be with others. Now, I don't know all of you. I can't make giant assumptions about why you're here. I'm hoping you're here because you're feeling something about the potentials of what this network can give you or the potentials of what you might be able to create within it that it calls to you or it speaks to you. Um, but I would hope that there is a sense of urgency to coming into a space like this, that you can think about how do you hold this space? Not just network, not just create exhibition opportunities, not just create funding moments, not just create collaborations, but actually try to create a space of holding to deal with the sort of ethical urges um, that we, we're gonna need to be able to hold people of disparate spaces um, coming from disparate sets of institutions all together. Um, now that's a lot to put on Rashini's shoulders, um, so she can't carry that herself. Uh, to test it out, I'm hoping that this can start what we try to do over the next day, is to really think of this gathering as a space that we can try to hold. Um, now that's not about speaking truth to power, being honest, and you know, I can be frightened. Yes, it has some of those elements to it, but I'm really thinking through and quite critically about how do we talk about these things with other sets of people, how do we engage in these sets of work? And then how do we take ownership and responsibility and accountability for our own actions within those processes? So this is just a sort of starting point. Right. So I have been consumed by um, work by Derek Walcott for a bit. And um, uh, Derek Walcott, uh, St. Lucian, uh, poet, playwright, politician, um, has an essay that most people don't read. Um, it's a brilliant um, uh, essay um, that is essentially a part of um, Dream of Monkey Mountain. Um, part of the essay is sort of trying to riff and think about theater and the production of art um, within essentially colonial spaces. And there's a portion within the essay itself where Walcott starts talking quite critically about um, these questions of poverty and indigeneity and place and um, creativity, and he sort of struggles with this. And this is, a, this is a passage that, when I first started reading it, 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 it said a lot to me about Walcott, first of all. Um, and, uh, but it also started to say a lot to me about conditions. And I'll just read that one. The dust was a raucous chaos of curses, gossip, and laughter. Everything performed in public with the voice of the, of the inner language was reflected in manner. As far above the subjects as that sun which would never set until its twilight became a metaphor for the withdrawal of empire and the beginning of our doubt. The passage goes on quite a bit. And um, as I've been really working with this and thinking, both in terms of uh, ecological issues, but definitely in terms of power paradigms between sets of folks, really started locating a lot of my work around the withdrawal of empire um, and maybe thinking about what is it to exist in twilight? To live within the potential or the sort of sustained becoming, right? Um, and uh, this is a colonial, uh, imperial conversation, but it could be one that we could have in other settings. If you do this training, you will become X. If you do this exhibition or internship, you will become what? If you get this funding, you will become this thing. If you then do this other thing, this other thing will happen, right? There is this kind of really interesting sense of exchanges uh, about that sort of becoming stage and what is supposed to occur at the end of it, right? This thing that ha happens at the end. Um, and there's a very seductive aspect to that becoming that just says, if you just give a little bit more, if you just acquire a little bit more, if you just do this X, Y, or Z thing, you will then hit that becoming, and, and all great things would happen. And I'm really quite fascinated around black, brown, multi-hued, non-binary, all sets of different sets of people, about what that becoming might mean. That becoming might have recognition, it might have acknowledgement of your humanity, it might have the promise of freedom. It might have the promise of capital and wealth, right? 
but you have to go through X or Y based on somebody else's understanding of what you need to do to then become something, right? What Walcott is trying to urge us to do, and what Walcott helped me to sort of think about, is what if that becoming never becomes? Instead, it is a constant C of you doing, thinking that you're going to achieve that thing at the end, but actually, you're just in a perpetual state of existing in life. And what you do is continue to do stuff because you think you're ultimately going to get there. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a bad or good thing, it's just really helpful for me to start to think about the forces I'm working against about my own contribution and what I might do. So this isn't to say the forum should happen, this isn't to say that I should write grants and hire people to go after various different issues and then try to dismantle certain systems or think about social justice, is to remind myself that I am working in twilight and that the more that I get seduced by these things about becoming, the more I do the work of other people, right? The more I lose sight of exactly why I'm supposed to be doing that work. I'm not doing the work of the cop. Does this make sense? Um, and I'm, I'm raising it now as we start to talk about praxis because I think it's deeply invested in praxis. There are many who are engaged in practice because they want to become, not because they want to do. I would put myself into that camp as well. And we talk about the urgencies of decoloniality or what that sort of process might look like or the practice of it, um, often, often encoded in if you hire 47 brown people or if you put up enough pictures in the room, decoloniality has happened. And I'm all about the practice, right? Like what is the practice of decoloniality? What does that actually look like when people are engaged with each other in equity? What does that system look like? And what does that structure look like? And what are the procedures of it on a day-to-day -day basis from picking up the phone to walking in the door? Not just commissioning work, not just putting it on an exhibit, not just having a fancy mom and to celebrate things. It's about that practice. And that is where I think our similarities between those of you who have created practices that you think about in the same sort of ways where I'm thinking about it around power and really starting to think about what does that essentially that practice um, look like. Because what I'm hoping we can do is sort of stimulate ourselves to not live in twilight, right? To not live and perpetually exist in that space where we are essentially becoming and doing to fulfill other people's expectations of ourselves. Right. Now, there are two things that are bothering me about all of that. <clears throat> well, but two. One of them is this performing presence that I call it. Um, and that is essentially recognizing that there are certain bodies that are coded at certain times in a way that they are hyper visible. And there are certain bodies that are coded sometimes at the same moment as invisible. And what we can do when we're doing our doing around our practice is perform our presence. That makes sense? Performing the sense of being visible to other people on potentially sometimes our own terms, maybe performing presence, maybe not without our own choice because we're the only X or Y person in the room. So it's simply by breathing we're being, we're performing that presence. But what does it mean to remain absent? To be visibly in the room. You, you, are, you are wrecking all the non-binary people in the entire universe, and you are in the room, and you are invisible to people. No amount of doing that you will do will make you present. Right? I would imagine some of you have been in similar sets of circumstances, where you think that you can just continue to do more stuff, right? If you just practice at it better, if you have 47 more engagement meetings, um, a set up another consultation, talk to people really openly, set up these sort of forums, these spaces, and you have these sets of interchanges, and you still will believe them feeling empty. Like you've not actually made any further progress with actually having a set of equitable sets of exchanges, um, and, and it, feels, it feels devoid. Now, I'm not trying to raise all the problems in the universe. Eventually, I'm going to show you some pretty things. Um, <laughs> 
But, uh, but I think there's some interesting tensions that are worth constantly reflecting on when we're thinking about our practice. Um, and thinking about what are our strategies of producing and creating and being. Because this, for me, is part of the criticality. It's not just about the end product and putting it somewhere and to get people to think about and reflect on something. It's also in the doing of it. Because um, again, I go back to, I want to make sure I'm still whole at the end of this. I want to make sure you're still whole at the end of this. So I'm not asking you to necessarily give more of yourself in an effort to somehow magically solve all these major crises. Because we end up carrying all of that, often, thinking that if we just continue to do, we'll just be able to solve. And I'm like, well, we need to think a bit more critically about our practice because it may be that we're doing ourselves much more internal damage by continuing to pick it, because we're not thinking about the strategies that we need to employ, right? <coughs> and, more importantly, we're not working together. I'll get to that in a minute. Hold on. Right, so, Hector Macharia, who famously rejected academia and um, has a fascinating essay that has this line that's in it. And this one um, is one that I think about a lot. Um, and I must think of how to be in toxic soils. Deracination and transplanting obsolescent habits in climate change worlds. It's just, it's just a lovely little sentence. Um, but if you think about that, right? You make, okay, who's, who works either independently or in a space of equity? Like your institution. Is that it? Yeah? Because you, you're, you're, a, you're a proprietor of yourself. Do you have to interact with anybody to get any money? <laughs> do you have to show yourself somewhere with some sets of people and have to do some exchanges about that? <coughs> do you give up your time to other sets of things and the help that it might give you profile and like, Presence? Do you schmooze at things and hope that somebody might pick up your stuff and do some, something else with it? Do you collaborate with different sets of people, sometimes questioning their integrity? Right, okay. You are living in toxic soils. I, it doesn't mean everything is toxic. It just means you're probably living in society. Okay? But, then, but more importantly, you may actually be interacting in spaces that have a variance of toxicity. Maybe toxic people. Maybe the institution is perfectly fine, but the people are toxic. Maybe the procedures and the processes are toxic. Part of my pushing at this is to help us sort of think through, again, back to that strategy and practice and working, of just recognizing what we have to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. The actual, and I call it research work, the research work you do to navigate your day. To actually try to set up any show, to try to set up any, any set of interactions it is an, a, a constant coding and decoding to try to understand how to do that. Especially for any of you that represent difference in your skin, visibly in your practice of a religion, in your name, anything that you might be doing that might ultimately be doing more work for you. Uh, or people might make assumptions about you based on a whole set of circumstances. You are probably wrestling with these levels of toxicity. Now that doesn't necessarily mean I'm saying give up and go hide in the corner. It's just to recognize that if you're going into some of these spaces and if you have an iota of interest in doing social justice work, you are essentially trying to clean these places up. And that is an incredible amount of responsibility, accountability, and danger. I mean, I'm excited by it, but that's me. I don't know if you're excited about it. If you're not, you need to figure out some strategies to help you navigate it, if you want to keep doing that work. It really is just very simple. And this type of thing is foundational to being able to do some of that work. Because again, we're holding each other here. This is going to be a space that we can practice and think about how to practice equity, what that ultimately might look like. All right, practice. Practice, 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 practice. Now, I've been thinking, as I've been saying, thinking about this as a practice space. Um, and for me, it really it starts from 
uh, the moment I meet people, to the moment I pick up the phone, to the moment I sort of say hello, to I start having exchanges, to people who email me, to tweeting. I mean, I, I try to think about this, and not it, it gets hard. But I recognize that half of the work that I want to do is to practice in a way that makes that satisfies me much more than about satisfying other people. Um, and also simultaneously is something that I can look back and go, I am practicing exactly what I want to be, as opposed to being something that other folks, somebody else wants to be. All the lovely things, as Jeremy said, love. Like, there are lots of things in university that love about half of that, but some of that is not necessarily the way I practice. Right? It's just information. And I try to practice in a way that is sort of undercuts a lot of that hierarchical type of stuff. But that's, what, that's me trying to recognize my practice. But that means that I have to think quite critically about what I do and how I interact, um, how I treat people, how I talk to people, how I navigate certain sets of terrains, and how I have to uh, often um, undercut other people who want me to become something else. And that takes some effort, um, quite a bit of effort. All right, so what are the possibilities of what some practice could look like? So uh, this is as, as, uh, Esther uh, Figueroa. Um, uh, Figueroa. Anybody know Esther's work? Um, so Esther, uh, as it says, um, is a uh, Jamaican born, um, calls herself an activist filmmaker uh, and a media maker, um, typically writes about the environment. <coughs> Um, thinks quite critically about the work that she does around um, uh, traditions of knowledge and, um, and spatial injustice. Um, you may recognize this, which was one of the things that um, her company was involved with, which was Jamaica for Sale. Um, and Jamaica for Sale, I uh, wanted to show you a beautiful trailer of it, but the trailer I, um, I picked up was, um, I didn't like the quality of it. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting about it is that uh, if any of you uh, know anything about Jamaica or if you know anything about the Jamaica Tourism Commission, you'll know that Jamaica is sold quite specifically in a particular way, um, from cruise ships to all sorts of things and the interactions. And what Esther wanted to do was essentially talk about what does it mean to essentially turn all the resources in a, in a, or, or a significant amount on an island into creating consumption for other sets of people. So most of the film talks about the labor that is used to build the high rises, or it talks about the gates that are made to screen out the regular people from folks coming on the cruise ships. So you see an incredible amount of barbed wire fences um, that are set up all around what is the island um, that is essentially talking about the ways that the, the, the internal officials um, have been involved um, in essentially trying to prop up and, and, and propagate this sort of fantasy Jamaica um, but on the backs of the people who are laboring, right? Um, and I really, I, I like uh, Esther's work. She continues to write about, um, she's done a, a beautiful piece on cockpit country, talking about bauxite mining um, in the Jamaica Maroon area, um, and really talking about the toxicity of the soil and what has essentially happened. And, and a lot of her films tends to take on the voice of the planet. Um, or the voice of nature, and you end up having this sort of uh, narrative voiceover um, in relationship to sort of walking and being in space. Um, and it's, uh, it's if, if you're not there, you can pick up all, quite a bit of her work. There's a lot online on YouTube. Um, and I think Esther's doing, Esther, Esther is trying to bridge the gap. Um, she, you know, they, they, these have all won beautiful awards. Jamaica, uh, Jamaica for Sale also has won lots. Um, but she's also trying to produce work to get into the hands of policymakers to make changes around environmental practice. She's trying to activate and motivate citizens to get actively involved to question um, certain sets of practices, so to mobilize activism. Um, and she's, she's trying to make some interesting moves, uh, I think, in terms of the production of her work itself. But I find it quite interesting that many of you don't know about her work. That's not to say that you should, because there are about a billion different um, filmmakers that, uh, that are involved. But from a strategic uh, standpoint, I'm interested in the different sets of strategies that people are doing to collaborate and produce. Now, she's just one. There's loads of people who created collectives, they created forums, they created particular sets of groups. 
they worked extremely hard to rethink the ways of doing particular sets of work um, and to make certain sets of challenges. She's not new um, to a certain extent uh, to really think about the colonial um, um, urgencies, think about praxis. Um, and in fact, um, as Ash, Ash was reminding us last night, these processes are new either. Um, these are a whole set of methodologies that people have been engaged with. There are others. Participatory action, uh, social action, co-design, uh, decolonial practices, community engagement, participation is super old school, uh, equitable collaborations. These are all different names of what we could be calling this sort of process work. Um, some of you might do this on a singular basis, where you might work on your own. Some of you might negotiate with archives and archivists, uh, and community activists, and other sets of practitioners to do your work. You probably borrow some of these or make up some of your own um, in terms of thinking about what that sort of process might look like. I'm still intrigued about the toxic soils remember, and the strategies of trying to do this work and thinking about the equitable relationships that might move forward. So it's not necessarily enough to bag yourself as I do community-based work or I do collaboration. I would be like, now, what does that look like? Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, how you hold those relationships and what do you have to navigate like that are some of the power dynamics um, to essentially try to make some of that happen. So this is where I get to talking about procedures. Um, because I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the procedures that we have put in place, often without thinking about what those procedures might be. Um, they just sort of kind of follow us around. So there's another group. Um, this is probably one that many of you might know. This is Academy. Um, and the Collective Academy. And I'm, what's nice about what I'm going to read to you is this actually comes um, from Beth Poganelli's book on um, geontologies, where she's, where she's writing about the collective. Um, or actually, this is like, yeah, this is. Um, so, so she did give us a definition of Academy. For Academy. Refers to the point at which the tide has reached its lowest point, tied out. There it will stay until it turns, making its way back to shore until it reaches Calicone. Calicone does not have the negative connotations of the English phrase low tide. There is nothing low about the tide reaching Calicone. All kinds of potentialities bring forward. Okay? In the coastal region stretching from, I'm not even going to try to pronounce those because I haven't been trained properly to, to, to do the phonetics. Um, a deep Calicone opens a shorter passage between the mainland and islands. In some places, reefs rise as the water recedes. Now I really love this passage. Now if we go back to toxic soils, go back to thinking about practice, go back to thinking about twilight and this notion of the home coming. What I really like about the way that they um, produced and started to think about academy is to really think about that growth being revealed. Right? It's really nice. It tells you it's, it's a space. Doesn't necessarily tell you where the space is going. Doesn't necessarily tell you what is supposed to happen at the end. It is just a road. Not unlike the way I've been really thinking about what this, what this network can be as a, as a road. Don't know where we're going. Not quite sure what the destination might be. It's trying to pull people on a particular set of a journey. But it is a road that's being revealed. And that is an interesting kind of practice, right? And an interesting kind of procedure is to produce a pathway. Now, this also comes from Kadabin's website. Um, this is a, a piece of a, part of a multimedia installation um, uh, from last year. Um, but I'm going to read this to you. The Kadabin Film Collective is a grassroots indigenous based media group. Their medium is a form of surveillance, which is here listed as a refusal to relinquish their country and a means of investigating contemporary social, social conditions of India. Now, hold on to survivors, and we'll go back to that in a minute. The films represent their lives, create bonds with their land, and intervene in global images of indigeneity. Now, that all sounds nice from a, from a creative practice. You're like, oh, this is very interesting. This is this interesting little indigenous group doing stuff. What I find fascinating about the procedure of Kevin is the fact that they created an indigenous corporation and have made it mandatory that any person who is a non-indigenous individual has to come to the collective with resources. It is an obligation. 
procedure. Okay. You recognizing the types of toxic soils that are around you, this is not, this is, okay, yes, they're creating art, they're creating work, they're creating films, they're putting together really interesting, provocative, informative, interesting stuff, they're working with archives, they're troubling notions of, of um, uh, uh, no notaries and um, maps and various other things, but they're also thinking about what that procedure looks like on a day-to-day -day basis of trying to operate as a collective, of trying to be, be and work and, and come together and think about what that practice is going to look like. I think if you talk about Academy, you should be talking about that corporation every time you talk about them. Talk about the art that's great, but that corporation is very, very important to both the longevity and the sustainability of Caribbean being able to do any of this, but it's also because it's a requirement of people interacting in the space for our people who are non-indigenous to come with resources. That is an expectation. And they negotiate that as they interact. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a, a specific type of interruption that they have chosen to, to put into place that is not just about creating and it's not just about this notion of kind of thinking through particular sets of terms. Um, um, and, but it's trying to do it with these procedures. Now, I'm cognizant of my time. Here's the bigger picture. I can talk about it when you, if you want to with any questions and answers about some of the ways that we're trying to intervene. Um, I'll just nudge you by saying one of the things, that, one of the biggest interventions that we're doing in this project um, is uh, we have uh, community researchers who are doing their own research on all of the cultural institutions with no control. They are an autonomous research community in the midst of our research project, which is freaking at the Arts Council. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can talk about it, but I'll, I'll just leave that for now um, and then leave you with um, this picture. This is kind of what I've been trying to take you through. Now, one quick thing about survivors that I didn't know about thinking about it, is I'm really quite interested about, um, and this comes from, um, this is a Derrida through to some indigenous scholars like Bisner, and it comes through thinking about um, survival, people have added it to survival and resistance, um, or to survival and endurance. Um, but it's essentially what some of you might be doing, which is create cultural products and things that are speaking to domination and oppression. Um, and that is considered to be these sorts of um, narratives of survivance, it could be art of survivance. Um, and I'm really thinking about this as, as, as survival and sustenance. It's been my latest now. It's thinking about being a member, back to, I'm trying to figure out how to keep you guys alive. I want to know how to sustain you. So yes, I'm thinking about what are the strategies of doing different sorts of changes, but I'm also really keen to think about what is the sustenance? What do, what do I feed you? What do I give you? What do I, what do I exchange with you to try to keep you able to do this work? Um, and I'm hoping the network can think a little bit about that while I was also thinking about um, interfering in this criticality. Again, this is back to Macharia's kind of toxic soils. Um, so I've got three questions. This is, this is where I'm going to finish today. Um, I don't know if I have any answers to them, but I, I like them. And I like the urgency of actually sitting and actually sitting with them and thinking about them um, as I'm thinking about practice and various things. So read them through. Can we engender new features from the totalizing impulses of old frames? Can we? And that's not just being in an institution, that's, 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 that's just thinking all the way to the mechanics of doing your practice itself. Um, any of you are working with photography, it's thinking about the mechanics of that, the, the, the film. It's really, it's just processing and thinking some of that stuff through. Um, and then in where and how can we hold open the future potential, that growth, right? That this revisioning office as we move and migrate and grapple with the many presences Visibilities and hyper visibilities that meander through our worlds. Really interested in that. It sounds great to think about a road, but a road coming from where and going to where. Who's able to be on it? Who's, who's kept off it because they don't have the right credentials? Or they don't have the right capital? Um, or they don't have the right class? Or they didn't go to the right school? Or they don't live in the right region? Or they don't speak the right language? 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about creating exclusionary circles, um, even if it's exclusionary circles for hit people, um, that, that doesn't really recognize the value and, and bigness of, um, of humanity. And the last one is, what does it mean to do criticality and remain whole in unjust spaces? Really, really interested in that. Um, and and I, again, it's not because I think this is easy work. It's just that there's no checklist for this. It's not like you just do it four times and you're done. And then you just sort of walk away. Um, but not only what the, is what does it mean to do it, is what does it look like? What does it look like? Is it an unfinished project? Maybe. But what does it look like? And that may be something I think you might need to be answering yourself individually, but I'm hoping as a collective that you can start thinking about that kind of urgency, um, especially if we're really thinking about interrupting in sets, sets of conversations, sets of practices, sets of procedures, um, and really thinking about what that creative force can ultimately be. So thank you for your time. about all the things that I've heard. I've heard them at the same time as you, so I'm not prepared to, to bring anything new to the conversation. Um, I would like to push you a little bit in certain directions. Uh, one of them is, um, I guess, where I'm coming from, right? The, the work done in Cuba. And I was thinking how much of what you're saying is requires a certain right to individual action, yeah. uh, freedom of speech. Uh, also, how much of many of us, perhaps not all of us, uh, use to that end a structure that is toxic, but at the same time is enabling, like a university. Um, so, what happens with A? Do you have to be in a certain position to 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 do this, and how much um, can actually, or what would it look like to do this from situations of oppression that are more structural? Mm -hmm. um, other questions would be about how we clean up our institutions, which I think we think about that too much, so maybe that's not. <laughs> but how about um, how about other uh, like? In visual culture or in museums or curatorial yeah. practices, what kind of uh, what would it look like yeah. to, um, to to do this? Yeah. And um, the other question I had is about the importance of um, of rules, which eventually you you addressed. But in many ways, the production of laws usually or should be. Ethical. They're about um, protecting the vulnerable. So, in this, how do you interact with the idea that some processes are, you know, annoying, in, but they are also leading to virtue, to transparency, or to justice in some other ways? Um, so, institutions, yeah, oppression. Um, thank you. I think I'll start with the. Uh, um, I think I'll start with thinking about uh, positionality. Um, I mean, I, I don't in any way deny that I'm in a privileged position. I mean, I, I, I'm at a university and I have a full-time job. Um, and, um, but I think there, there is something quite critically important for me to remember that um, um, the uses of my privilege. And, um, I mean, you know, I do say that, but there's uh, the, the latest uh, higher education statistical information has come out, um, and that information says uh, for some of you this will be you, you won't care. But um, but but I think this is really for me quite critical because while I have a PhD, yes, I'm um, uh, based at a university. Um, I, I haven't always had a PhD. I'm always a PhD. Um, I've got about 25 years of community development work working in the community uh, on issues around racial uh, inequalities and inequities. Um, but um, there's 17,500 white academics in the UK system. Issa tells us there's about 3,000 black academics. 
I will eat that with you. Um, and that's, that's, that's before I've even gotten to trying to talk about people who might identify as female. Um, and that's academics. So that number, that terminology, it encapsulates a wide range of people who, who, who are considered to be academic staff. Um, so there is a question of the positionality and privilege that and how far does that essentially go. Um, it, it looks different in different spaces, but it also at the same time means that I walk into spaces and I thought of like either as the cleaner. Often. Um, a guest coming to the university. Um, uh, or a student. And in fact, somebody just recently said to me, you should feel really pleased that somebody thinks that you're a student. And I was like, I know it's not because they think I'm 20. It's not. So there's something going on in that space that, that, is, that is thinking differently about operating in it. Um, and it does mean that that privilege doesn't carry in that space. Now, it works differently when I work with in certain situations. Um, ironically, I was just talking to a fascinating uh, uh, um, elder from St. Lucia um, who uh, was saying to me, you know, you need to say to people that you're Dr. Salt. I'm going to introduce you as, as, as Dr. Salt. In fact, I'm Dr. Karen. Um, and, and I was like, that, that's not my place to, to call myself Dr. Salt. He's like, no, 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 you have to. He said, because you are, you, you're, you're the future. And, and, and we have to talk about that. Um, and I find that, you know, I find that kind of work kind of fascinating. But it does mean that when I go to certain spaces where nobody cares at all about the university, nobody cares about, they don't care about research, I'm just the person just trying to understand um, or sit beside them or, or, or listen to their lives. Um, so I, I recognize that all sets of institutions, from the home to the university to a hospital to an island activist community, they have their own sets of rules, they have their own sets of practices and procedures that don't necessarily follow any particular kind of model that, I you know, I'm not saying that this model that I'm looking at here, talking about art, or universities or other spaces, might translate to working in, um, uh, with a community in St. Lucia or a community in Nova Scotia. Um, but there are some actual interesting commonalities about thinking about um, being in oppressive spaces and thinking strategically about moving in those, um, especially if we're talking about public bodies and public spaces. So I know you're saying um, thinking differently about the Caribbean and being in various locations, but working in the Caribbean or working in other places in the diaspora, I see many more commonalities around power than I do dissimilarities among sets of people. Um, and I think there's there is a there's a there's something quite powerful and important to, to start to think about well, what's the knowledge and the strategies that are happening across this whole terrain um, and trying to share those. So to bring the comments and thinking about the for example museums, mm -hmm. it's I understood that just having more inclusion in museums was not enough. I mean, it's, in, in a way, you were saying it has to go beyond that. Yes. So it's not just the inclusion. What else would that look like? Uh, I mean, there's some people in this room who are heavily involved in um, holding museums accountable um, and transforming, working with collections and um, um, challenging, tailing particular sets of narratives and stories. Um, I think, yes, yeah, some of that is thinking about that work without a doubt. But there is also a recognition that um, if you are here in the UK, um, you, you will be feeling some pressure from funders to account for bodies in a particular way that come into your spaces. Um, and that is having, that's having a massive impact um, on how people are going out and working with various communities. Um, so we, if, if, if you're getting money from the creative case, uh, the Arts Council, and you know what I'm talking about um, in terms of what those what those processes that are trying to look differently are are, are potentially creating. Um, and I mentioned about the bigger picture project. One of the things about the bigger picture project that um, is at the core of it is is actually coming up with um, decolonial assessment models. 
which is actually one of the spaces that we don't actually have a lot of understanding about assessment and evaluation models. Um, and the thing about the creative case for diversity is it's made assessment and evaluation extremely important now because your funding is included in the funding. But we don't actually have processes that are invested with that same kind of urgency that people are thinking about commissioning or, or, or putting, you know, working with their archives or working with objects. That's just left over here um, to do assessment and evaluation of any kind of programming or material. Um, so we're trying to think quite, quite differently about it. It's taking the same idea. So not that it's saying that it's not enough, but it's sort of thinking, think of the whole institution, right? Think the whole place. But that means uh, security, catering, um, commissioning. I mean, it's, it's the wholeness of it, as opposed to the nice and neat space that works with the community, or the learning group. Um, or the people who might work with artists. Because I, 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 I think that you, you practice equity throughout your whole structure. You don't practice equity in the bodies of the few people who have that title of community engagement officer. I think we should open up for questions from the audience at this point. Are there any questions? Or comments? Don't be shy. <laughs> Mind, but I've had to protect those researchers. 
so that they're not a diversity forum. They're not a consultation group. They are they're doing research, and they need to be left alone um, when people have wanted to go and pull them to do things for the organizations. And, and my one question that was raised, which was, well, what if they're finding out things that the organizations don't want to know? To which I didn't respond very well, um, but primarily said, I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, is what does the community want to know? Um, as opposed to what do the organizations need to fix? Um, and, and, and then, so it's less a freak out than I think it is a, a kind of, a different kind of reckoning about community engagement and interaction. Um, and for us, it's a repositioning of knowledge and, um, and contribution to recognize that these community researchers are researchers um, in their own right, contributing um, research to this project. Um, and and I, I know what's happening. Um, and I, and I give back, we give feedback and they can bring us in if we have some interaction and we've done trainings and skills work with them about some specific things that they've asked. But we've also validated the types of knowledge and skills that they already have. Um, and simultaneously said that what they, what they are contributing is something that is um, important enough that we want to showcase it within the project. Uh, and just to give you a sense of some of the things that they want to do, their findings that they're putting together will be a performance. So they're going to do a public performance of their findings for the arts organizations and the public, which is fascinating. Um, they, weren't, they weren't told that they, they just said that we'd like you to pass on your information, but it's their decision to try to do a performance piece. Um, so what's now happening is now we're being looked at as like the potential future for all community engagement. We're like, I mean, that's not what we're doing. Um, we're doing a particular set of projects with a particular set of urgencies with a particular set of questions. But we're very interested in how to create these sorts of equitable partnerships among sets of people. Um, and back to that holding space, that has been my job, is to hold that space, to let that happen. And, and some of that is also holding the organizations, because the cultural organizations are necessarily always playing friendly with each other, for themselves. Um, so that's been a lot of my job, to, to, to try to model what that might be. Um, and I, I, we've, we've enjoyed ourselves uh, immensely with this project. It is in October. Um, there's a showcase um, which will publicize and people can come to. I think there's a microphone, but I think we can shout. Thank you so much. Um, so much of what you said kind of resonated with me, but also like blew my mind, especially a bit about you know how we establish this new kind of assessment model. Um, I guess I'm thinking about my situation. I'm currently doing a PhD at Oxford, but I'm off um, because it was you know so many things were things you say, feeling like you're kind of battling and, and um, I guess. I'm looking to survive this thing, yeah. um, and everything you're saying about kind of having these strategies, for me, within that in institution, within that place, I'm simply like not willing to invest time and energy into that, um, which I, I know is kind of like uh, my responsibility to do so then makes me feel a bit like guilty about that, so I'm just like, I can't. You should feel guilty. I, 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 I often tell people that my, my job right now is to be of service. But I am super choosy to who, who, who I'm of service to. I'm not of service to anybody. Um, uh, you know, the, the whole way this week has looked for me in terms of the amount of talks that I'm giving, um, including being part of the Scott activist talk on, on Friday and Saturday at the British Library, meant that if, if Roche calls me, I'm like, yeah, I'll be here. Um, even if it means squeezing that into my life, because I can be of service here um, in a way. But, but back to what I was saying about sustenance, you guys are feeding me. I'm being totally honest about it. Um, in terms of being able to produce and do the work, you know, I need these sorts of moments to be able to continue to do that. So I don't think you need to strategize. But there's certain people you can write them off. I have no shame of saying, I just, you know, and nobody deserves a teachable moment for me just because they're in existence. Um, I don't think I've written loads of people off. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, that, that kind of awkward um, like boundary between um, you being very aware of what you're saying affects the person that 
marking you on an identity level and you're being critical of them and, and, and how close together intelligence and ignorance are and trying to navigate that boundary all the time and it's just kind of like, yeah, uh, it's work. It is serious work. It's work. It's, it's, it's a completely different set of work. It's not just about creating mm -hmm. um, an output or a material or an object or, or, or art, right? It's a, it's a whole other set of stuff. For some of you, it's wrapped up in all of that same process, but I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, I don't think finding your allies is a is a is a, a, a throwaway term. I think it, I think it, it's a serious endeavor, um, which means that your allies could be in your institution and they could be completely outside of it. Um, but and and, I, and I'm really very keen on back to what I was saying before about sustenance. You know, for some of you, you are working in spaces or you're working against certain sets of challenges. That you you you've got to think about how you're feeding yourself. I, I mean, you just you have to, and that's a practical thing from like, do you actually eat every day? Practical thing. No, I'm being very serious. But being practically like, are you just feeding yourself? To also what is helping you to be creative, to be able to continue to do this work. Um, and we don't talk a lot about the mental aspects of some of this work and trying to do it, but it is quite, it is quite charged. Um, of, of trying to maintain our own safety, um, to be able to move forward. So I think investing in that and thinking about it the same way you would invest in um, your materials, or the same way that you might invest in whatever else that might, uh, you know, that you find that is of value is, 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 is equally as important. Um, so I, you know, I just I wish you lots of lots of love, but I also would encourage you to reach out to people and talk to folks. Um, you can you can email me. I'm at Karen Salt. I'm searchable. Um, I'm at Dr. K Salt on Twitter. I will eventually respond. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. That's one. Who amongst us in this room 
carry that work all the time anyway. Um, and it's not necessarily about being privileged or not, it's because you, you can do that emotional labor or you can reach out to different sets of people. Um, but I think it's not, you know, we can't, there's going to be some work I know later on where people are going to be talking about performance and archives, but I think you cannot lose sight of the trauma of some of this, some of these pasts, of bringing these pasts into the present, of working through them. Um, so the fact that you have to put the book down a little bit makes sense to me um, uh, in terms of trying to move forward. Um, and I, I would hope that you can continue to have these conversations uh, because I think there's there is this question about, you know, is Twilight fixed, right? Or is it just um, a, a set of particular set of conditions that have emerged? Um, and, and we're discussing them and talk about them here. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also at the same time trying to wrestle and understand while we've had issues around um, ring rush, there is now a Wing Rush Day. And that is not to deny the fabulous activists who've been working on getting that day for a very long time. Um, and that day is coinciding in the same year that there is this scandal um, and a reaction to people's status. So there is a, a deeply pessimistic part of me that wonders if we're still existing in Twilight no matter what is there to become something else, right? Um, and, and that's where that's where I just I, I don't and I don't necessarily think you know there's a, there's just a abdication or just a sort of oh it's gonna be fine it's going, or we have to make a room somewhere. This is we, it, this is all good stuff. It's just a wrestling with it, I think, more than anything. Um, and for me that wrestling is productive um, as opposed to just solving the situation. It's the wrestling. Um, maybe that's the best way to exist in the twilight, is to, to, to exist in it fretfully. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. So you um, shared a statistic, I think it was 3,000 black academics or 17,500 white academics, which I worked up to about 15%. And I think when you share that number, I think perhaps assumption is that we think, okay, that number should be higher or distributed differently. And then, you know, you put all these examples, bigger picture, um, but it is, and you use the phrase, want to fix, which I was caught by, I wrote it down. Um, and so, for example, in New York City, where I live, uh, the Brooklyn Museum right now is under fire uh, with the question of creating a decolonization commission. And so all these various initiatives in Europe, in North America, because all seem to be driving towards this idea of changing the institution in terms of representation, programming, etc. So I'm just wondering how this fits with, or does it fit with Wooten's um, argument in Under Commons, where he seems to suggest that places like the university fundamentally should be places where we operate as renegades. Yeah. We take the resources we can, but we don't, at least the way I read it is, we don't become so invested in fixing this institution. Uh, I don't know if that means institution beyond redemption or that he sees more autonomy in staying as kind of, you know, slightly out of reach. Sure. Because these seem to be going in two different directions. One is perhaps taking us deeper into the institutions in an attempt to fix, and the other is kind of being on the periphery of the institution. Um, I guess I'm not trying to go deeper into the institution per se. Um, I start with the notion that these are public institutions and they have a public responsibility. Your money's going into them. Many people keep sending their kids to them, whether or not this is an art space or a university. So we get, I, just from a, like an absolutely pragmatic perspective, I don't want to just turn them loose to capital to just sort of solve what needs to happen. Um, and, and I think it's, there a lot of the urgencies that I'm interested in I, I, I don't see why they wouldn't have a space in those spaces. They should. If, if I really believe that everybody should be having this conversation that I'm, I'm interested in having, 
then I, I can't, I don't want to write off spaces or say, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk to you about that. I mean, it's just like, I, I, I can't do that. that. Um, uh, but I also recognize the forces I'm up against in terms of what some of these institutions are imagining themselves to be and, and how, they are, uh, how they're operating in an existence. Um, so it's less necessarily fixing the institution um, then it might be um, creating roads of accountability within those institutional bodies and responsibility um, for um, the equity that it needs to, 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 to have amongst sets of people. But I think this is, these are the, this is where the strategy comes in for me um, and trying to think quite critically about all of that. Um, I don't really take on any responsibility of fixing. That's not my job. Um, I think my, my main job for me is, is to wrestle. Um, somebody said to me not too long ago about being crafty, um, and and I and I actually think for me that that's a lot more what I feel like would be under commons is the craftiness um, of of using every single strategy that you can you can touch um, in terms of trying to move forward, um, and that's where the fugitivity feels like, you know.